And I didn't really have a message today other than to review his message. Um, pulling at some things and, you know, as the days pass, it's just certain things that still ring in your head from what he said last Sunday. I can't get over how we're trying to cover up the funk with garments and uniforms. And he said nothing is wrong with the garment or the uniform. They don't have a stench. It's what they're trying to cover up that's causing the stench. And um, that, that message last uh, Sunday, you know, really focused on atonement. In the old practice of atonement, you'll see in the scripture that God never told Moses to call a day of atonement. He tells Moses to tell Aaron to call that day. That's not a day for you, Moses. That's going to be a day for Aaron to call. And when they do this, he'll take certain garments and he will disrobe and he will put these garments on as an act of purifying. And let's take a couple of goats. And one goat, we're going to lay hands on the goat and then open the gate and allow the goat that we have laid hands on to escape. This is where we get the term scapegoat. We done laid hands on him because of the sins. Not of the wicked, but of the believers. Y'all come on with me now. Huh? He ain't talking about nobody outside the house. He dealing inside the house trying to get it clean. You can fix up the outside of a house and it can look wonderful. You don't know what's inside. So he said, they put the hands on the goat and let it, let it go carrying the sins of the believers as a scape. In other words, it ain't me. Let me point to somebody else. They the problem. If it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be like I am, a scapegoat. Then we're going to take another goat and we're going to slaughter that goat and sacrifice it unto the Lord. We're going to additionally take a young bullock. This young bullock is a bull that has been castrated. And we're going to slaughter this and sacrifice it unto the Lord. Obviously, it's all symbolic. But when you got a teacher like Louis Farrakhan, he show you how to properly unpack it so we can understand these things. The goat is a mischief-making creature. Any sheep herder knows that sheep are very humble creatures and peaceful. And sheep don't have a record of even fighting to defend themselves when they're attacked by the wolf. You can lead sheep in a line and they can watch one get slaughtered 
right in front of it and is not even pulling back to say, I don't want to go and get what he got. They'll just keep going, doing the same thing in a procession, one right after the other. That might be why we're characterized as sheep. You done seen what happened to other folks, and you ain't even trying to avoid the path. We got a record of histories in front of us of how people have messed up with God. So um, we're going to take this bullock that's been castrated, and we're going to slaughter it unto the Lord. The mischief-making among righteous people slaughtered and sacrificed unto the Lord in atonement means that a person now is slaying their mischief making and sacrificing it unto the Lord that I'm through with living a life like that. The bull is seen as a rebellious creature. So if you slaughter any bull saying to the Lord, I'm going to give up my rebellious ways against your law and against your will, as long as the bull can reproduce, you'll come up with another rebellious act. But by slaughtering a bullock who's been castrated, that means when you slaughter this creature, You've also killed its ability to reproduce the act of rebellion. That's what real atonement is about. So we got a real message of atonement last week from the Honorable Louis Farrakhan. Not something symbolic. Because symbolism means you can put on anything, but what are you covering when you put it on? And you don't have to cover it with holiness underneath because he, he made it clear last week, ain't none of us holy. And he started with himself, right? But just to hunger and thirst for righteousness, Jesus said, blessed are they. I just want to be right. I don't know every way of how to be a perfectly righteous person before God, but I at least want it. What I heard the minister talking to was a spirit where you don't even want it no more. That's the spirit we have to go after. So he said, you know, Satan has urinated on us. The skunk of the planet Earth. When the urine of a skunk gets on your garment, I don't know if Tide or Cheer or that can really get that out. You basically, anybody that has ever had the awful experience of having a skunk urinate on them, um, you know, he raises his tail and he sprays it. It's not like it drips on you or something. He sprays it. This is how you keep creatures off of them. Then that stench is on them. It can even bring death to some of them if it gets them right in the face. But uh, that's how he protects himself. Uh, the stench is too great from the gland that secretes this awful odor that comes from the skunk. And once the skunk does it, it's in the atmosphere so long, you can be driving down the highway and know that you have come in the area where the skunk has done. You don't have to see the skunk. This is why the messenger used the skunk as the pale face man, the white man, because you don't have to see him. To know that he's been there because you see his work. The ghetto, urban blight and decay is his work. 
You say, but I went through there. All I saw was black folks. Believe me, when you're wise enough, you'll get the stench. Well, I see us doing worse to ourselves than anybody. We didn't produce self-hatred on our own. It didn't even come with the creation. This is why you need the life-giving teachings of the honorable Elijah Muhammad. You need somebody to teach you beyond. When this cracker got his hands on us. We're even around, you know, what, what are you going to say about Project 1619? Because we need to go back to the beginning. That ain't the beginning. Well, did God, you saying God revealed to the honorable Elijah Muhammad that we came over here before? No, the white man got it in his library. According to the honorable Elijah Muhammad, he read it in the, in the congressional library. We came over on the good ship Jesus in the year of our Lord, 1555. And we didn't come over um, initially to help them cook some biscuits and fry some chicken. We helped them to learn how to build. They didn't know how to build. That's why when you see them come over, come on, just follow me for a minute. You and I grew up, we watched white folks, they showed us, they chopped down trees and built log cabins. We was building pyramids. We was building, we was, by the time we got over here, we had already built pyramids. We had built the great city of Timbuktu. We had large things. The messenger said, you must study us from the 5th to the 7th century in the northern horn of Africa. And said, stop just identifying, he said, with the primitive part of Africa. Well, we're going to have an African festival, so everybody wants to walk around with straw and shake and everything. Okay, we did some of that, but man, we were falling apart by then. What about Michael Jackson's video, The Way We Were? When we was kings and queens and wearing gold, plated, remember the time, that's it, remember the time. And he showed us, man, we had castles, we dealt with, we cut out marble. We were master builders when we came here. So, so once a man comes and he begins to do a work to, you know, clean us up. Look at Adam and Eve. Naked before the Lord. That's not a nudist camp. Naked means I ain't got nothing to hide. All of a sudden, they sin. And because they sin, they went and found fig leaves. So when the Lord comes, he's trying to figure out now, what is the leaves all about? You didn't even need that when you had a relationship with me. Now you got to be the minister or the bishop or the so-and-so or I'm the so-and-so. You know, fig leaves just mean a lot of titles and stuff we give ourselves. Fig leaves is a whole lot of stuff we use to cover up the funk. If they needed fig leaves, hell, the Lord would have gave them fig leaves when he created them. I'm just trying to review my father's message. You know, work it in to my spirit and say, let me try to get back on this thing. He said, when your life focus is on just pleasing the flesh, you already dead. And that's the level that most people live on. They're just trying to please the flesh. Let me go over to Wendy's. Let's have sex. Let's take a vacation and chill. Let's say anything to please the flesh. But no spiritual feeding or development. And believe me, Anything that you ain't feeding will die. Even a vampire got to feed. But a life where you don't feed your spirit, either with prayer, study, meditation, 
reading, investigating, studying, whatever it takes, when you're not feeding your spirit, it ain't no way it can live. And if you think you don't need the spirit, you can get a thousand FOI. You'll never change nothing out there without his spirit. Not by power, not by might, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. So the ministers say, we go into the streets with a moral imperative. We leaving the moral imperative behind and think a program will succeed. But everybody is looking. So Jesus saw a fig tree and cursed it. And he wasn't talking about a fig tree, the minister said. He was dealing with the religious order of this world. Because the way a fig tree grows, once the leaves come out, the figs have ripened. But when they went to get some figs from this tree, they lifted the leaves and there was no figs there. So Jesus cursed the tree. But really he was talking about the houses of faith. All dressed up, crescent and star, everything's lined up. But ain't no spirit. So he started condemning everything. Going to church ain't no spirit. It's a lot of theatrics, but where is the spirit? The prophetic spirit and voice of the church is what's needed in the community. Well, no, brother minister, we need some so social programs to better the people. That's Satan's gospel. You can't even get it off the ground unless Satan give you some money. That, that ought to tell you something right there. And if Satan's program for social betterment can really help the people, then what was the gospel for? And I'm talking about the gospel of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. What was it for? Why would Master Farad Muhammad come if we could have solved this from the government? According to what I heard from the Honorable Elijah Muhammad when he said, religion has failed you. And then he said, the government has failed you. And Islam only comes after everything fails. It's not here with an option page of multiple choice. Ain't no multiple choice. You done had your multiple choices. And you done checked every box and every box failed you. Now comes the life-giving teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And see, I, I know where black people, I heard a white preacher say this. He said, you don't like Pharaoh, but you don't want to follow Moses. And I said, that's where we are. He's right. We, we mad as hell at Donald Trump, but we don't want Farrakhan. Not like that. I, I like to just talk about him on Facebook, but that's about it. Don't bring that how to eat the live to me. Because then that requires discipline. But Oprah can talk about it. And the white doctors told Oprah, I was watching the program, she said, I thought breakfast was the most important time to eat. They said, Oprah, that's the worst time to eat. <laughs> See, we, we're still freed slaves. A freed slave is, you're free to walk around and be a nigger. Right. 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 You're even free to, to believe the honorable Elijah Muhammad, but we just don't believe it till the white man says it. He already told us on how to eat to live. He told us God came to him and revealed himself to him and gave us a way out. So as the, uh, Brother Lance was telling me, they're, they're, they're rebranding everything in our program. We don't have a cable program on with sisters cooking. It's all these women poisoning the human family that's cooking. We need a program on with the MGT laid out. I saw a studio in this city. It's got the, the, the kitchen, the cabinets, and everything. You ain't got to do all the cooking there. Cook the stuff there, but then show them the science. 
turn those kitchen cabinets into medicine cabinets. Take that kitchen and turn it into a clinic. That is the life-giving teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. People are taking it and trying to rebrand it and come out here with something. If we would just do the work we was told to do, they wouldn't even have room for this. We're so busy running from the mosque. Trying to rebrand ourselves and go out there with another program under another damn name. This is the work that saves lives and souls. This is what got me up. 38 years ago, the preaching of Louis Farrakhan, the life-giving teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Yeah, so he said, you know, we, if we just please in the flesh, then we're already dead. So, in this few minutes we have, Look at the second chapter of Revelations. Um, where, you know, they make revelations out of the Protestant Bible, uh, 66 books. They make revel uh, Revelation the last book, but the Honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches us it's really the first book. Right. Right. Mr. Yaqub could not read creation in a way that he could predict the future. He left literature for his own followers who weren't white people. You got to remember, he died. He never saw the white man. He just had an idea. But he didn't live long enough to see it. So stop all that teaching. Well, you know, y'all cool. No, he had some black folks. So all the wickedness that you saw done on the island of Patmos was not done by white folks. It was done by black people. Just like the wickedness you see today, it, that's done by black people. It's, it's Black people with a white idea living inside of them. That's what spiritual and moral leprosy is. Jesus would have to heal the leper because you're black with a white mind. And you do anything to destroy black. Oh. Um, in the second chapter, he says, I know thy works and thy labor, and in thy presence, and how thou hast not bared them which are evil, and, and how thou hast tried them who say they are apostles and are not, and you even found them to be liars, and how you have borne patience for my name's sake, and labored, and you have not fainted. He said, but this thing I have against thee. He said, you got a good community. You're faithful. You work hard. You don't let nobody get in on you with no false teaching. Right? You run them right out. And, and, and you've been steadfast. And to the best degree, you have been patient. But now he said, but this is the thing that I got against you. He said, you have forsaken and left the first love. So these are the three steps he's saying. He's saying we're off the, now that's what the minister was talking about. It's in some other words, but he's saying, look, we're off track. We're off, I, I wasn't looking at somebody else when I'm looking at myself when he's talking. That's the way we should have been taking that message. And say, okay, we're off track. Uh, this is how we're going to get back. Number one. Remember the place 
from where thou hast fallen. Number two, repent. That just means stop. If you're going to Atlantic City and find out you've been driving toward King of Prussia and already find, are you just going to keep driving toward King of Prussia and your goal is to get to Atlantic City? Or are you going to stop? and turn around and, and start heading in the right direction. So the, the first thing to do is remember the place from where you have fallen. And then repent and then look at the third thing and then do the first work. Now that's the subject today, the first work. Because the first work is really the only work. I heard, I think whoever did that put it on Facebook, a clip of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And he's dealing with the problem that most inner city dwellers are having right now, which is a homicide by way of firearm. And he's saying, we're out there, I'm paraphrasing him, he said, you're out there killing each other for what? He said, for nothing. Then he said, then what are we supposed to do about it? He said, the thing to do about it is to teach them into the knowledge of themselves. Right, right. Then he goes on to say, those who are with me, they were once fighting and killing one another. But when I taught them into the knowledge of themselves, they don't do it no more. Now we can rebrand and go out there with every other label you want and every other program you want. You can put all kinds of things on it, but this work, the first work of the nation of Islam was and is the work that can stop the killing because you don't have nobody out here that's putting life in people. A program can't put life in you. Only God can do that. And if you got a program without God after he has come, we're not talking about, well, he ain't got here yet. Because our job is to preach the presence of God. If you preach the presence of God and not yourself. And as the messenger said, if I'm out there and you're not out there, because the only way to fish, if the fish see me, I'll never get them. But if they get the bait that I got out there for them, I can get them all the time. My bait is Louis Farrakhan. My bait is the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. I'm baiting you. You don't see me till after you bit down on what they taught and find out you can't get away from it. You, and then you look up and see me and say, damn, where he come from? I'm just really <laughs> Huh? That's the first work. So all over the country, men are trying to do great things. Women are trying to do great things to stop the violence, but they're not fishing. Because the program that they got set up, they promoting themselves. The first work had nothing to do with ourselves. We were to lift the messenger. So he said, teach them into the knowledge of themselves. So let's unpack this now from the scripture. It, the first thing to do, he said, because you're off track. The skunk done urinated on you. You can't hide it with a uniform or a bow tie right. or garment. Is that what he said? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, remember the place from where thou hast fallen. See, in 1975, people said, well, we fell because we lost the farm. Well, we ain't got no trucks on the road, or we're not building the bakeries no more. We're not doing, no. It's like Brother Jabril said, we fell. 
when we lost trust in, respect for, and love for the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. That's where the nation fell. And see, once we were dead again, the flesh begins to decompose and rot. And as the minister said, the sinews and the muscles, everything is eaten up by the worms of doubt, distrust, disrespect, and self-hate. And it ate us down. We're like bones in the valley again. All of this have happened to us inside the house. And so now, um, it's been said many times, we tell time by the minister's mind. Well, you say, well, I can't read his mind. He speaks his mind. You don't have to try to figure up and tune in. Just got to listen. And listen again, and you know, but he speaks his mind. And like the woman that's clothed in the sun, that means that's a man, there's no aspect of his life that's out of harmony with the light that covers him, public or private. So when you start decomposing, the minister says, see, you don't look the same. But if you can remember the place from where we had fallen. So he talked about scales being on his eyes. See, scales is something that anything that starts covering the eyes and covering the heart. Don't mean you don't have a heart, it's just covered. Right. Don't mean you don't have eyes, you just can't see like you used to see because the heart is covered now. So the minister said the first scale that had to come off. was we had gone to sleep. So now a man can be said to fulfill that which is written the first among those that slept. Because the honorable Elijah Muhammad is the first from the dead to rise. A 100% convert. Committed 100% to the first work. You don't want to sell final calls, but you got a program out there. You want to run out there. We could run out there with the final calls. Somebody said, well, we want you to over here. You should be over here doing it. Well, what are we going to do? We're going out in the community. That's what we were supposed to be doing in the first work. Is somebody listening to me? Hell, am I crazy? Or wasn't the FOI already in the street? All we got to do is get up and get in the street again. The biblical scholars say that this church fell because the old believers had died out. And they had got a new generation of believers into the church of Ephesus, but they didn't have the zeal for God that the others had. The biblical scholars said they did good work, but they were poorly motivated. And the motivation, the ministers say, is the determining factor. It's the dial for how much of God's spirit is really going to be with you when you do what you do. So the minister said, so I, this scale come off. I had to see the honorable Elijah Muhammad now in a greater light than the one we had saw him in before the sleep came on us. Because he said, see, disappointment in that when things start covering the heart and cover the eyes, it produces a darkness in your life. Are y'all listening to me now? Because see, whatever an, an example goes through in front of you, that's an example of what we're going through and will go through once the heart is covered. It'll produce a darkness. And that's a scale that's got to come off. He said the next scale that had to come off, I had to see that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was alive. That's a tough saying. Folks done wrote up death certificates. Um, had a funeral.
so when people try to add that up, they say, well, how can you say he's physically alive? Now, that's not the whole subject today to go into, but I'm just saying that's something we all had to wake up to. Certainly the minister. He wasn't there at first. He, it, didn't, he, it didn't detract from him seeing the value of the honorable Elijah Muhammad and the value of his work. But today, by seeing him properly, awakening up properly, he's able to see that ain't no way he could be successful unless his messenger's alive. I know my Redeemer liveth. And I'm saying if this is necessary for the most successful man, on the planet to reach the mind, the heart, and the soul of a human being, then how can you come up with some flimsy program and think you're going to resurrect the people that's out here in the city killing each other? The white man was right when he was preaching. You don't want, you hate Trump, but you don't want Farrakhan. Same way the other people dislike Pharaoh, but they didn't want to follow Moses. There's a crop of people only follow Moses because they cut welfare. They wouldn't let you into the universities anymore. The HBCUs closed down. Police was doubling and tripling on the murders. And you talking about mass incarceration. Every time they turning, our communities are like open air uh, prison camps. At least one person on every block got a, a thing on their ankle. That's open air incarceration. We following you. Um, no, that's very true. And that's why they gave Moses hell after they got out there in the wilderness. They really only left because they was catching hell. So um, he had to believe he was alive. Now, scripturally, you can you can plot through this and see that they never really killed Jesus. The Jesus that they're talking about in the end time. And so the Honorable Elijah Muhammad gives us a whole history of that, but um, the people who say they want to resurrect the work of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, but believe he's dead and gone, don't have the success that the man who's preaching that he's alive is having. I mean, that's the math. That's the outcome of it. So he had to believe. Now, this next scale is real important because in the Quran, he says, expand my breast for me. Make it bigger. The heart needs room because it's getting bigger so that it can have love, the capacity to love beyond his own community. And of course, that's going to be misunderstood. But in the sayings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, he said, what I have given you is the basis for universal teaching. He said, it's not universal, but it will become universal. It must be built into a universal teaching. So what he gave Farrakhan was the foundation the base for something that was to deal. You know, folks are mad. Why is he over in that country? God has made him for humanity. And with an expanded breath, you got to have expanded understanding. With an expanded breath, your insight got to be deeper than it was when you started out. If you're only dealing with your own folks, your insight ain't as deep to help people that are beyond. 60% of the people in the Western Hemisphere speak Spanish. And um, the expanded breast means he looses the knot in the tongue. The first knot that had to be loosened, as the Honorable Elijah Muhammad worked with it, was that he had to preach Islam to a people who were steeped in a 
Judeo-Christian ethic. So he didn't come to us just talking Islamic about the Mahadaya or the Mahdi. That's a term we start using later on. You know how he got us? He said the Savior. Come on, somebody. If you go over there, you don't see that term. But as he's talking now, remembering what his teacher had told him, that unless you speak the language well, you will not have the success that I desire for you. And the minister said that language that Master Farad Muhammad was referring to was the language of Christianity. He didn't tell him to become a Christian. He just said, learn the language of them. And he told a handful of us one day in Detroit, he said, y'all's problem is you only got a handful of people because you're preaching Muhammad. He said, I'm going to preach Jesus and get them all. That's probably why he has to go. He's so misunderstood. And when a person gets up and starts imparting knowledge to people, you're impart imparting your misunderstanding of him along with that knowledge. So then it makes the people think more tribal, less universal, and then we disqualify ourselves to work with people beyond our own camp. So he had to do this, and he said there was a fourth scale, and that was to begin to see how God was using the devil and the devil's work to further his own plan. Boy, that's a hell of a thing. <laughs> because, you know, we're in a land where we think personnel change remedies everything. No, we do. They're, look at the vernacular now. 2020 is coming. We got to get Trump out of the White House. Is everything going to be all right once you get a personnel change? Last time I checked, you was catching hell under Reagan. You was catching hell under Bill Clinton. I don't really know that you came out of hell under Barack Obama. Are you following that? But you think a personnel change is going to change everything. Let's get rid of this person, put this person in. And get rid of this and put that one in. So, but, but we, don't, we don't contextualize it where we see a larger framework of activity and plan and design. So the minister's been given the largest framework to look at this thing in. He said, well, you know what? The devil's helping us. No, really. How many people come and buy a message to the black man? I'm talking about well-placed Negroes. And people that are in government, involved with legislation, involved with the executive branch. Black people that are judges and things. See, they're not reading it. Not on no large scale that we know about. We, we can track the sales and tell who's reading it. It's the little man and woman in the street that are reading it because they can get some hope from it. But you got other folks not reading it. But they will read what white folks are writing. So judgment, the messenger said, is not a time when a God is sitting on the throne meeting out rewards and penalties of eternity, he said judgment is when God makes everything to tell on itself. So the white man is telling on himself when you get his books. He shows you the depth of his evil. The messenger said he's kept a record of all the evil he's ever done. How, how can our black historians give you a day-to-day -day account of life on a plantation? How did they know about the, the rapes and the camps that were set up and what was done to our children, what was done to our women, what was done to our men? How did the slave didn't even know how to read and write? It was against the law. Once he learned how to read and write, he went and got the records because the white man kept a record of all his evil. The messenger said the library has a record of it and the courtroom has a record of how he has ruled over the people. He told on himself, all you got to do is go and record it and bring it out and it'll buttress your argument. Um, 
The devil was made from the weakness of self. So when you start talking about a God can use the devil to further his, your God-like character can use the weaker part to help you become more godly. What's the chief characteristic of Satan? Deception. In fact, he's called the arch deceiver. So watch this now. So one day, the sons of God came before God, and Satan was with them. And what did the Lord say? Satan, whence comest thou? And Satan, the arch deceiver, didn't say, well, I thought about my ways, and I'm going to convert over he didn't say nothing like that he said i'm going to and fro up and down in the earth seeking whom i made the why did he tell the truth when he's an arch deceiver you can't be a devil in front of god so the best so the more godly you are the less of a devil a devil can be the minister is talking about the more we surrender to god and sound more like him he said don't just study him and find out what he said absorb him you do it. We did it in communion. It was a cracker in the church where I was at. That's, they said, eat this. This is of his body. But he wasn't talking about cannibalism. It's a body of knowledge, right? And I'm feeding on it and drinking a little wine of Welch's. But anyway, the blood is the life. But the thing is, the minister is saying, start absorbing this one that came and revealed himself to the honorable Elijah Muhammad, incorporating uh, the way he thinks and the way he would do things into your daily activity. And over a period of time, you'll sound more like him. You'll even think more like him and do more like him. It will increase your faith with respect to him and zeal for the Lord will come back because that's what he's talking about here. Look what he says. He says, remember from where you have fallen, repent and do the first work or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place if thou does not repent. So the candlestick is your house being a light for somebody else that's in darkness. The more people rebrand what the Honorable Elijah Muhammad is doing, the less that we're doing the first work uh, the more we're in a position to just have the candlestick removed out of his place, because this ain't the place where light is in anymore. Who, who in darkness wants to come to another place that's fallen in darkness? No, come on now, that's just real. So the minister is making this thing, and see, his, his mind is telling us what time it is. A time is very short to get our act together. So, um, so this admonition to the church um, is a call for us. You know how you come to Islam? Um, you're so excited. You don't hardly know nothing. You're just full of questions and everything. But you're, 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 your joy level is high. Come on, somebody. Uh, the enthusiasm level is high. And when you really like something, like a, a vacation spot, a restaurant, or something, you're always eager to tell somebody else about it. They say, well, what about this? And well, I don't know, but you need to come on over. Because maybe they'll talk about it today. We, we'll ask some questions, you know. But I know I'm excited about it. I think you would be too if you would come and expose yourself to what I'm exposed to. I don't know a lot, but now I know a lot, but I ain't got no joy level. I'm full of knowledge, but my joy is gone. 
Now all I know about is problems. Even after a God has come who's a perfect problem solver. Right. Right. Ah. So my attitude level now has been altered. You know why? Because my gratitude is my attitude. Once I lose gratitude for what God has done for me, first of all, that he came. Just because you've been around for a long time. I've been in this for 38 years now, going on in 2020. But that don't mean I can't lose sight of the great uh, favor that has been put over my life. I, I may forget how I was smoking cigarettes, using cocaine, doing different things and that. And in truth, where I was in my life then, I didn't have nothing that had enough power to propel me up out of that. One preaching from Louis Farrakhan about the honorable boy Elijah Muhammad, and when I decided to come to it, overnight I had enough power. You probably have a greater testimony than that. But if, if I lose consciousness of the seriousness of sin, which is what atonement is all about getting rid of. If I lose consciousness of the seriousness of sin, then simultaneously I'm losing consciousness of the real value of being saved. Once I lose the value of being saved, I ain't excited about it no more. I probably ain't talking to nobody about it. The first work looks less attractive than the new programs that are cropping up in social media and going around the country. And it only looks less attractive <laughs> because we've lost gratitude for the work. It looks like, ah, that's old tired stuff. God came, you accept it, there's a pledge card. Uh, they join in the class. They tell you what time to come to class and all of that and everything. And if we who are over the classes ain't excited about it, we can't, can't make nobody else feel excited. If, if I'm not excited about the moss and you bring somebody out here, if I don't look excited about what I'm in, can I really blame somebody else for not being excited about it? You better get some spirit. Not by might. Might means I'm using my position to try to force you into something because I don't have no spirit to inspire you into it. There's a difference in Farrakhan's leadership. In his leadership, you can do what you want, but he so compels you. Why? Because he's thoroughly excited about what he's in. And you can feel it coming from him when he's talking to you. And when he tells you out of sincerity, I'm on my way to being holy. I'm on my way to being perfected. You can feel that's a man that's trying with all his mind, all his heart, and all his soul. You know he's working with it. It makes you want to try. Oh, my God. Somebody can say, well, you know, you don't know what I've been through. You don't know what I've done in my life and everything. I know this. Nothing and no one in Christ is condemned. I saw a man tell the minister he wasn't worthy of something. He said, brother, you don't even have a right to say that once you under my leadership. I'll determine whether you're worthy or not. We are not the product of what we've been through and what we've done. That's the white man's way of doing it. He'll come on the news. They did so-and-so in 19, 
90. And then he'll come up with something else you did and everybody. And that's supposed to give everybody a picture of who you really are. But see, when you're dealing with God, huh, that old record, swipe clean. Nobody has a right to take your past and throw it up in your face on. once you have come to a man that saves. So then we're not the product of our past, but we are the product of the choices that we make. See, see, Joshua starts saying, choose this day whom you will serve. But for me and my household, we're going to serve the Lord. And we become the product of that choice. And then we got to try to live that choice. Is making sense? I'm almost finished. I'm just, you know, I'm really reviewing because the minister, you know, he, he, he went into Paul's preaching. And Paul was a man that completely gave himself over, but he knew the law. And he, he was foremost in the knowledge of the Torah and its law and everything. But when he gave himself over the universality of, of Christ's teaching, which the other disciples didn't understand, they wanted to keep it close to, you know, he, he had to go to Greeks. He had to go to people that live completely different from him. Affected by all, they had all kinds of affections and that, but he was able to make Christ appealable to all men so we got to decide we just have to decide you know what we what we're willing to to be because Moses was told put your hand over your heart he brought his hand out and his hand was like leprous it was the Bible calls it corrupted and that's because he had a heart that had been developed in the house of God's enemy. But now that he was standing with the Lord, and I'm so happy the minister made that clear, the Lord never said Moses was holy. Take your shoes off the ground you're standing on. And so you're in my presence. You understand? And so when I walk, people say, that's Minister Ronnie. He would No, I'm not right. I'm covered with righteousness of the man that leads us. That's the only thing that's making us look righteous. Ain't got nothing to do with us. It's the man that we're with who's covering us with his righteousness. No, that's, that's, and so, you know, he puts his hand back over his heart and his heart, his hand comes out restored because his heart was changed with the Lord. The heart, the heart is what you are. As a man thinketh in his heart, right? So it is. The heart is what you're, and the hand is what you're doing. What you do in life is ultimately going to reveal who you really are. He's showing Moses the combination. That's why the hands are washed before prayer, because the messenger said the hands are the are the greatest actors in the activity of your heart. So the Muslim washes his hands before prayer because what you've been doing. Is, 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 a, is a connection and a reflection of what's going on in here. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Last thing is, um, the door uh, of discouragement. This is where we had really had to be careful because, you know, what happens over a long period of time. And when you read about in scriptures how it took them 40 years, if you're reading it, um, you're probably thinking, well, I don't know about doing 40 years, but it's been 40 years. <laughs> and folks have gotten weary. And folks said, this is, this is a the trick your own mind can play on you. Discouragement sets in. I ain't getting what I want out of this. You know what? Hell, the wicked got more than I got. So, you know, 
<laughs> they don't even pray to the Lord. And they're getting more, and getting look like they're getting more. And it don't look like God is even thinking about me, let alone blessing me with something. I see heads bowing, so I know folks have gotten there. You ain't really living unless you've gotten there because you got to look. You know, you, you, even Du Bois said, to be poor is hard. He said, but to be poor in the land of riches is the bottom of hardships. And notwithstanding, the God promised money. Somebody said, you know, when the preacher, when you go to the preacher and said, my life's falling apart, I need money, he tells you, go pray to the Lord. But when the preacher needs money, he come to you. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, that's a double whammy there, boy. <laughs> but no, it's real. And it's 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 um the Lord has to remind the children of Israel, I didn't come to save you and destroy Pharaoh. Because of your righteousness, I came because of their wickedness. So the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said of Master Farad Muhammad, the principle of justice is what brought him. Yes, there's a great love for us, but he came to destroy the wicked. What he's saying is, we weren't crafted that way from the first work, because the first work goes back to the originator of the heavens and the earth. And, and he's saying, we may be broken up into tribes, some Republicans, some Democrats, some Christians, some Muslim, some this, some that. You know, I belong to this class. Well, I belong to that class. Well, I'm outclassed. You know, but you may be all broken. But at, our, at the essence of us, we are all the same. Because after creating himself, he continued himself in his own essence. And that's what you and I are created out of. That single essence was man and woman created from. Right? That's the first word. And when we go back to preaching the first work, when we go back to handing them the final call with the first word in mind and letting people know, You don't have to be no rocket scientist. You don't have to know how many stars are out there and nothing. All you need to know is this got me up. I'm a living testimony of the life-giving teaching of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, man. That's enough. Discouragement take your prayer from you. All you have to do is ask yourself, when is the last time I prayed? When is the last time I just really prayed? And the Quran says, guard strictly your prayer. That, that's, that's like an alert. They'll snatch it from you. You get it. He said, I wouldn't have even cared for you were it not for your prayer. And then they, it's a part in the Quran, they saw somebody, they said, man, you was a top soldier. How did you end up in hell? And the Quran said, he said, we were among those not praying. So the prayer becomes the lifeline. And the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, only prayer will advance you spiritually. So you can study for a thousand years. But he said, only prayer is, advances you spiritually. So he designed some prayers for us that will earn us, he said, great confidence with Allah and confidence in ourselves. Because the way the enemy did us, the average one of us has a poor self-concept. Once you have a poor self-concept, unless you face it and get rid of it, then you start operating in it where you have to compensate 
for it, doing crazy stuff to compensate for how little you really feel inside. Atonement will free us from all this crap. So I just heard our father talking to us last week. And he's he really trying to save us because, you know, as I was telling Brother Joseph earlier this morning, I said, you see, the minister taught us when the sun's light, you know, through photosynthesis, you know, works on the plant life, causing seed to, to germinate. And that um, he said the plant doesn't mature in the sunlight. The plant only matures after the sun is gone. It's in the night, he said, under the moonlight that the plant matures. While he's here, he's the life-giving sun. And there's no question that what you are getting from Louis Farrakhan has immensely grown you from where you are. But what is going to mature us it's not another lecture, not another YouTube gathering. What's going to mature us is his absence. And once he's gone, light goes with him. And if you got any light, it won't be from him. And he's not removing himself. His God is removing him. So our maturity will only come in the night of human experience. And if you think about it, if you go through the synoptic gospels, you don't see Jesus having one public word of praise for his disciples. You don't see him praising them anywhere. But yet, these are the men that changed the known world in the night of human experience. When their master teacher was gone, the disciples got busy. The Holy Spirit hit them. And Peter, who couldn't get 50 people, got 3,000 in one meeting. 3,000 acceptances in one meeting. See, and each day, the Bible says, more and more joined on to the faith. They were on fire. They didn't realize what they had had from the sunlight. But man, when the sun was gone and maturity set in, see, some of you don't even see yourselves right now, but when fire kind is gone, you're going to be on fire. You'll be shaking Russell saying, where the papers? Give me some more. Huh? How many of you want? Twenty dollars. Give me two bundles. Say, man, what got into you? The first work. It finally hit me after trying this program and going out there with that one and working this one and everything. You know what? What we got already is the best thing for black America. When the minister called the Million Man March, um, he gave us a pledge. And a careful study of the pledge um, will show you that he didn't come up with something new careful study of the pledge reveals the life in the moss from the law of God as revealed to the honorable Elijah Muhammad. He's being successful in the program of the honorable Elijah Muhammad and that is the first work. So I pray that uh, we watch the minister again and again of what he talked about. As he said, they're all powerful messages. But last week's message was so timely. And it may be that it was, it was telling us that a time is really shortening for us to look back squarely at what we got uh, and go after this with the right kind of heart so that you're properly motivated because they said only what you do for Christ will last. Ask yourself why so many good programs have lived and died. It, it's, not, it's not to put them down because people are sincere. They're working with 
whatever level they have. But this is supreme wisdom. This will get you clearly out of this. And, and, and you know, when you think about a rocket ship, I understand that most of the money goes into the launching pad. That's where the power is really needed. Because you're going you're gonna to have to fire this thing up against the laws of gravity. And it's got to at least travel six miles from the Earth's surface successfully through, through fire to get into space. But when the ship is going up, it's a big thing. And you see that big thing launching up and everything. But after it gets so many miles high, have you noticed that parts of it start falling off and everything? And it looks like if you're uninitiated in space travel, it looks like something's falling apart. But really, the parts that are coming off, they were designed to come off. They weren't even built to go the full journey. That's how a believer is. You start off on the ground and climb to the earth, man. But the, but the fire of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's message, coming through fire kind of like a rocket ship, you take off. And you got a lot of folks on with you when you take off, but pretty soon some of the family fall off. Pretty soon some close buddies fall off. So-and-so ain't texting you no more. You don't email each other. Things are falling off. Somebody will look, they uninitiated in space travel. They think your life fell apart, but no, they wasn't made to go the whole journey. You stay with Farrakhan no matter how many people leave you. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. All praise is due to Allah. So Brother Joseph's going to come up and close us out and take care of our business here at the mosque. And um, I pray that you all come out and start bringing some folks out. You know people that need to be exposed to what the Honorable Louis Farrakhan is teaching. And if you're bringing someone out, that means you have to come out. Don't you forsake this little thing. These little temples look crude to you now because we've gotten real sophisticated out here. But the, but the Quran says it was with crude planks and nails that the believers got out of this destruction that's going on. And pretty soon everything fancy will be going down. And I remember somebody said, well, Brother Minister, they're gentrifying the cities, moving all the black folks out into the suburbs, and they take him back over the cities. He said, yeah, because the cities is what's going to be destroyed. It's already written. <laughs> it's not the suburbs, but the cities. So we don't have problems today that weren't already foreseen by the prophets. And that's why we've been given a perfect understanding of both books, Bible and Quran. And that's the program. Thank you. Keep that round of applause going for our Delaware Valley Student Regional Minister, Student Minister Rodney Muhammad. All praise is due to Allah. Just by show of hands, do we have anyone out for their first time, second time? There's a, our brother right here. Thank you, dear brother, for being here. Any sisters, praise be to Allah. How many of us believe that what we heard today is true and that it's good for our people?